Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining Aspire for today's webinar. Aspire stands for Alliance to Solve PANS and Immune Related Encephalopathies. We aim to improve the lives of those affected by this devastating but treatable disorder. At Aspire, we have focused our efforts on programs that reach five core audiences that increase awareness and understanding while providing critical support to all members of our community. We increase awareness and education via our website, webinars, and toolkits. We support families via our Facebook group, one-on-one -on -one emails, chit-chat groups, and our provider directory. We educate schools via professional development in-service lectures so they can appropriately support their students. We help improve public policy by providing local advocates with advocacy tools and support. We support providers and researchers by hosting grand rounds, lunch and learns throughout the year and other specific needs. Please consider supporting Aspire so we can continue our educational and support programs like today's webinar. So today we have Dr. Williams. She is gonna speak on integrative medicine approaches to PANS pandas. She will discuss food as medicine, nutritional supplements, herbal therapies, and mind-body approaches to healing the inflamed nervous system um, and improve its functioning. In addition, she's going to talk about the importance of the removal of toxic exposures, which can trigger immune dysregulation. Um, she cares for adults and pediatric patients with an emphasis on overall well-being. In addition to over a decade of experience as a family physician, she is a board certified and trained through the Anda Weil Integrative Medicine Fellowship and is certified by Cornell University in whole food plant-based nutrition. Her clinical approach is a to identify the root causes of emotional, mental, and behavioral concerns by uncovering undiagnosed autoimmune diseases, nutritional deficiencies, auto environmental toxicities, and infectious etiologies. So of course, like any medicine, but in very particular to her approach, is very personalized to each individualized patient. And um, she has, a personal experience with Pans Pandas with her daughter. Um, I remember when her article came back, I forget what year it was, the unsung psychiatric impact um, of strep throat, which I will link on her main page. It still stands as a really great article. And um, in 2021, she published with a few other doctors, the treatment barriers in Pans and Pandas, to which we know that there are many. And she has a private practice in Pennsylvania in, in, at Endless Men Mountain Integrative Medicine, which is also linked into her page. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, have Dr. Williams speak. I'm really excited to hear her talk today um, and have a wonderful uh, view on the way she approaches treatment for this. So thanks for everybody for coming. And thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for taking time out of your patient schedule to be here. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriella, for that uh, introduction. You didn't need to read all of that, but I appreciate the introduction. That was very kind. And let me just see that I can share my screen. So thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak this afternoon. Um, this is a topic very uh, dear to me. As Gabriella mentioned, I have um, family personal history with my daughter. Uh, I wanted to start out, Gabrielle actually posed to me the question uh, through some emails in our communication about trying to define integrative medicine and talking a little bit about that, how that's different from an other approaches. So I just thought I'd start with that right there. So integrative medicine is um, healing oriented medicine that takes into account the whole body, mind, body, spirit. Um, are all aspects of a person, including their lifestyle and environment. It emphasizes the therapeutic relationship and makes use of all appropriate therapies, um, both conventional and alternative. It is based in good science, and it neither rejects conventional medicine nor accepts alternative therapies uncritically. It involves not throwing out conventional medicine, but instead merging both integrative um, 
and complementary approaches all together. So it's basically there's room at the table for whatever will work best to promote healing. I, I think people often think of it as being like holistic, and it certainly is very allows for that and opens open to that. It's really whatever is the best scientifically based option to help an individual person. <clears throat> So just to, uh, at the start, just to um, say I have no financial interest or any relationships to disclose, and I will mention that because this is a targeted audience for um, parents and families, and I think also some practitioners, um, but it is educational and informational. I will mention some brand names for convenience because I think it can be really helpful, and I have no financial relationship or interest with any suppliers um, of supplements or pharmaceutical um, companies. So I have come to be familiar with this condition through experience with my own child. Um, she had classic presentation, but I didn't know what it was. The doctors and providers who I brought her to also didn't know what it was. We had never heard of pandas. And um, then eventually her psychologist actually through a list serve found found the answer for us. And I'm forever grateful for that. Um, someone came back and said, you know, have you heard of pandas? And as soon as we saw that, it, it made sense for her. So that was about six years ago. And since that time, I've tried to learn all I can and to spread awareness um, about this disease and to try to help reduce suffering. Uh, so here I will, I guess, just quickly go through some of that some of the diagnostic criteria. I think most people coming to this are probably already familiar with PANS. Um, the hallmark of this illness is an abrupt onset of OCD or severe food restriction, plus the other neuropsychiatric symptoms that we see, such as anxiety, emotional ability, irritability, aggression, um, reg regression and deterioration of school performance, and often there's motor and sensory abnormalities as well as sleep disturbances. Um, pans and pandas is, I, I like to talk about it as an orphan condition, meaning that no single medical specialty has adopted the care of pans. Um, care is at the intersection between mental health, immunology, rheumatology, and infectious disease. And the care of this disorder crosses many specialties and often requires numerous ancillary services. Um, this, I think, demonstrates the, the relevance of integrative medicine and a multifactorial approach looking for root cause, cause of illness and targeting treatments. When evaluating a child with these mental health disturbances, a comprehensive diagnosis is very important, um, really important to find all of the underlying causes. We always need to determine if there are nutritional insufficiencies, other autoimmune diseases, additional infections, and environmental toxic exposures. Um, thinking of the example of a broken down car, if you have a car that isn't working and you um, go and so perhaps the the battery is dead and it's also out of gas and so you go and jump start the battery but the car still won't work you have to go also put in gas um, both things need to be fixed to get the car properly working again and I find that the same thing is very true with our health we need to address all of the problems uh, that the child is facing or the person is facing in order to restore well-being <clears throat> So many children will benefit from CBT and therapy to address OCD, and especially if their illness has been going on for a good length of time, this is especially important. So this is where we just look at looking at the underlying conditions, treating the infections, very, very important, modulating inflammation, and then doing uh, counseling and therapy. Just a reminder that any pathogen can cause PANS. <clears throat> we need to remember to check family members and other close contacts for symptoms of strep and other contagious diseases. I often find that a sibling is the strep carrier and that's what keeps the PANS child keeps getting sick as long as their sibling still is carrying the strep. Um, also really important to look, excuse me, 
um, at Lyme and other tick-borne co-infections, especially in, in the, where I am in Pennsylvania and in most of the Northeast, um, there is lots of Lyme. And more than 50% of the ticks carry co-infections. So they may, we have to look for those as well, um, such as Bartonella, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and Rickettsia. Mycoplasma, which is also sometimes called walking pneumonia, can also be suspected and a source for some children. PANS can result from influenza, Epstein-Barr, uh, mono, and herpes simplex virus. And SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID, is also emerging as a cause and actually seems to be helping um, increase the understanding that a mental illness can have psychiatric manifestations. So I think that has been one of the hidden blessings of COVID has been a more generalized public awareness of how an illness can lead to psychiatric symptoms. So I just quickly want to show a slide where we look at the brain because that's really what we're talking about is an illness that affects the brain. And we're specifically looking at the basal ganglia. And um, just to show, PANS is an autoimmune disease where autoantibodies incorrectly attack the brain. This creates inflammation and dysfunction in the basal ganglia, which you see here in the center of the brain shown in blue. And understanding the functions of this part of the brain helps to understand the behaviors and the symptoms that we see in the kids with PANS. Um, this is a, a slide um, out of Stanford by um, Dr. Tiananmen. And I, I just think it's so helpful. Um, let's see, I just lost my speaker notes, sorry. So it's so helpful to really look at what the function of the basal ganglia is. And when we see what the function is, it's not surprising how inflammation in this area may lead to the symptoms and impairments we see in kids with pandas. The basal ganglia is the relay station through which connections um, to neurons run that control mood, emotional, process, emotional processing, procedural learning, motor movements, cognition, and sensory processing. <clears throat> so PANS and PANDAS is often described as a post-infectious basal ganglia encephalitis. And I agree that this name more clearly defines the etiology or the cause of the condition. So there are so many modalities and treatments that can be utilized. Um, for the sake of time, I had to choose some. And for today, for an integrative medicine approach, I have chosen to discuss mind-body techniques, um, inflammation reduction, and nutrition, as well as uh, the gut microbiome. So targeting infections is a primary part of integrative treatment. Um, it is one of the three prongs, you know, the three pillars of treating for PANS, um, but I'm really not going to discuss it very much today, but this is so very, very important to have the uh, infectious etiology identified and um, discussed, but we just don't have enough time to cover everything today. Um, so I'm going to begin with discussing techniques that link the working of the mind to the actions of the body. Um, so emotional dysregulation is a core, or emotional regulation is a core function of the basal ganglia, and therefore it is a core dysfunction in PANS. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body and runs from the abdomen to the brain. It actually also runs in the reverse direction. It is one of the few nerves that has both efferent and afferent uh, fibers, so it goes in both directions. So when the vagus nerve is stimulated, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the rest and digest system. It's the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, fright, and freeze system. So that sympathetic nervous system is what is overactive. It's on override in our kids with pans during a flare. You are likely familiar with the deer in headlights, the glazed over look in our kids. You see that in their eyes. It's the almost wild animal-like quality that makes it so hard to engage or connect with them and makes them feel so uncomfortable. 
this is what you're seeing as an sympathetic nervous system response overacted on override. So we cannot directly control our sympathetic nervous system, but we can counter it with the opposing symptom system, the parasympathetic nervous system. So we can activate the parasympathetic nervous system by engaging and activating the vagus nerve. Um, you'll see I have the image of a book that I really like called Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. And this is great to learn some techniques, um, but I also wanted to mention some simple ones that you can start using right away. Um, one of the ones that is my most favorite is doing deep belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. And this can be taught to very young children. Um, to do this, we just can place one hand on the chest and one hand on the belly. And then you slowly inhale, bringing the air down in through the nose, through the throat, and allowing it to expand the abdomen. This allows us to breathe into the lowest lobes of the lungs. And our low, our, the lower lobes of the lungs are where the largest proportion of parasympathetic nervous system fibers are. So when we expand that part of the lungs, we activate this. So you have the child bring the air in and expand their diaphragm like it's a big balloon. It's easy to have children practice doing this while lying down and maybe take place like a tiny stuffed animal on their belly, and then they can watch it up and down, watch it go up and down. Um, there's lots of you know, YouTube videos and things that you can watch and have children watch to learn how to do this. You can also further exaggerate diaphragmatic breathing by doing it when you are in uh, certain types of yoga poses, such as forward folds. So bending over, you can do it while standing or while lying down. You can even be sitting in the bed and then just lean the chest forward, bringing your chest towards the knees. And then while in that forward folding position, again, focus on doing diaphragmatic or belly breathing. Now, of course, these breathing techniques have to be taught and practiced when the child is not in a flare. And then once they are familiar with doing them on a regular basis, like every you know, morning and night, sometimes during the day, then they can be utilized when needed. Another technique that can be helpful in the moment that really can be used during a flare um, is, is putting cold water to the face or bringing cold to the mouth. And this also stimulates the vagal response. Um, so, you know, the idea of, you know, people are upset and you splash the face with cold water. So, of course, we're not going to do that to our child, um, but it is something that you could suggest to them that they might want to do themselves. Like if they're having a extreme agitation, you could say, well, perhaps do you want to try to go to the, to the bathroom and splash some cold water on your face? Um, can also get the same effect by offering them something cold to eat, like a cold popsicle or an ice cream cone. Um, sometimes when the children are having a significant uh, episode of agitation and a tantrum, um, it may also be related to having low blood sugar. So I often find that offering like a fruit smoothie, something that's cold that they can drink through a, a straw, you could make with frozen bananas, frozen blueberries, maybe some almond milk and dates. And this could be really helpful in some tough moments. Um, so some other methods of, um, of affecting the vagus nerve are by using more detailed or more kind of diff, uh, like more specific breathing techniques. And these can be learned on something called heart math. Um, I have an image there showing the website. Heart math is a free website. They have, they do have some paid applications also, but they have lots of techniques for relaxation through the parasympathetic nervous system. And the use of heart math is where you can affect heart rate variability. And this has been studied in the literature and can really reduce the sympathetic nervous response. So I highly recommend checking that out. And I do have some pictures of little yoga poses here too. And um, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, videos and things that you could use to help your child become more acquainted with doing some yoga.
Let's see. I'm sorry. I lost my speaker view again. Let me go back. Okay, there I'm back. Sorry about that. So sleep is also so important and something that is, I think, sometimes overlooked. I mean, it's not overlooked by all of the parents struggling with their children not being able to sleep in the middle of the night. Um, but it's really important to identify and discuss that children with PANS have very high rates of fatigue and very disturbed sleep. The child who was previously sleeping through the night on their own may now be unable to fall asleep. They insist on sleeping with parents. They have frequent insomnia, nightmares, restless sleep. They often have reversed sleep cycles where they can only sleep at different times during the day. And when we actually study this with sleep studies, um, a sleep study is abnormal in 89% of the kids with pandas. Um, they 80 to 85% of them show something called REM behavior disorder. This is when the child has movements during dreams. REM sleep is when you're dreaming. Normally the body is supposed to be paralyzed during that time, but their body will not be paralyzed. And you can see movement of the limbs moving around. And this is really very uh, poignant to me because the other disorder that has REM behavior disorder occurs in Parkinson's. And Parkinson's, of course, affects the same part of the brain as PANS, the basal ganglia. So this can be a useful, um, you know, sometimes it can be done diagnostically if we really need to have a crystal clear diagnosis for treatments. Um, otherwise, it's really just helpful to see some objective findings that sometimes we don't have with other areas when we're looking at PANS. So in order to help sleep, um, a sl establishing an excellent sleep routine with good sleep hygiene is key. It's recommended to have regular, consistent bedtime with a routine of soothing events prior to bed, you know, using a dark and quiet space, using the relaxation breathing that we discussed and other techniques. Also meditation and uh, sometimes bedtime yoga can be very helpful. Avoiding caffeine altogether and also avoiding screens for at least two hours prior to bed. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep losing my presenter's view. I'm The computer I was planning to use didn't, didn't accept Zoom today, so I just shift on to a tiny one. Um, so, and, you know, we talked about sleep study a moment ago. The other reason that sleep study can be really helpful is in looking for obstructive sleep apnea. And um, looking for parents can be looking for signs of mouth breathing and snoring. Um, night terrors can be associated with sleep apnea. And sometimes if we identify sleep apnea, and if it is due to obstructive sleep apnea with big, large, tonsils and adenoids, then these may also need to be removed. And this can provide resolution for some children with pandas. Um, some supplements can be used at bedtime, such as melatonin and chamomile, L-theanine and lavender essential oil. You can also use topical forms of lavender. Um, I really like this cream that I have a picture of here called Magsuthium. Um, it's a mixture of magnesium and arnica and lavender, and this can be smoothed over the back and the legs, and especially in these children who often have a lot of body pain, uh, it can really help to ease and allow them to fall asleep. Uh, for melatonin, I, I like this product that I show here. I'm just showing it because it is a liquid and it can be delivered under the tongue uh, sublingually and you still give it 30 minutes prior to bedtime, but it'll go directly into the bloodstream that way and not have to go through the stomach. And so many people who are having these difficulties have gastrointestinal disturbances and often they have malabsorption. So this is one easy way to get that in. And I do prefer it rather than using gummies, which especially at bedtime, you know, get on the children's teeth. And even with brushing the teeth, we have to worry about tooth decay. 
Um, using a bedtime worry journal or a worry jar where you, the parents or the child can write down things that they are worried about and we can put them in a special book or fold them up and put them in a jar and talk about how this is something they don't need to worry about now. They're going to be going to bed and they're safe. Uh, magnesium uh, and Epsom salts can also be used at bedtime. Um, Epsom salts can be added to the bath. And Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. Uh, magnesium sulfate helps to increase the natural production of glutathione, which an, is an antioxidant. And magnesium in its own right also helps to ease sore, tense muscles and helps with relaxation, sleep, and even constipation. So oral magnesium is also very helpful for relaxation and easing pain, constipation, and sleep. Um, we can use uh, magnesium citrate in a powdered form uh, called COM, or we can use magnesium glycinate in capsules. Um, I really can't overemphasize the importance of physical activity and exercise. Uh, we, there are numerous studies that show the benefit of physical activity for children. It helps to control aggression and outbursts. It helps to counter the rigidity and compulsions we often see, and it helps with focus and concentration. Um, it decreases intrusive and unwanted thoughts and decreases anxiety. Um, doing all different, any sort of casual exercise, walking outside, getting into nature, but also martial arts classes can be really helpful. Um, running, walking in the woods, hula hooping, um, games, swimming, I find especially helpful for so many children, especially ones who have a lot of sensory integration difficulties and sensory processing. Um, being submerged in the water seems to help many of these children feel more relaxed. But anything that we can do on a regular basis will dramatically improve the mental health of our children. If there was a drug that could improve mental health as much as exercise, um, everyone would be prescribing it and we would all want to take it. And I know that it's really hard to get kids to do this sometimes, um, but I would encourage you to find ways to try to make it fun and try to make it a regular part of your family activities. Uh, doing mindfulness and meditation is also very important and can be really helpful for some families. Um, in one study, they show that just two months of regular practice improves mo mood and math scores and happiness. It decreases the, the reactivity, the agitation and anger, and uh, decreases emotional ability. Um, I would suggest looking at the work of John Kabat-Zinn. I love this book. Um, and also use of Insight Timer and Headspace. There's lots of free apps available. Insight Timer is free. Some of the others have small costs. And you may be thinking like a lot of these kids are not gonna be able to meditate, but something that is really uh, wonderful about these studies is that they show that if the parents meditate, it actually improves the, the um, psychiatric manifestations in the child. And even very young children can be taught to do just tiny moments of um, slowing down and mindfulness, such as before meals, just taking even 30 seconds to breathe before we begin to eat. Um, before meals is a great time to do diaphragmatic breathing, especially when we have a hyper overactivated sympathetic nervous system. The, the body is just not ready to accept food. And you know we'll see a lot of GI symptoms, nausea, sometimes vomiting, of course, so much of food, restrict, food restriction and food avoidance. Um, but doing deep de belly breathing prior to eating and bringing in a moment of mindfulness allows the to relax the sympathetic nervous system, allows to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, and to relax the, the stomach. It begins the digestive process. So that's one time to do it. And of course, at bedtime is always another opportunity just to bring some quiet and mindfulness into the day. So modulating inflammation is really a cornerstone of the treatment of PANS and PANDAS. Um, we remember that the underlying cause of the behavioral changes is the inflammation in the brain. 
And with an integrative approach, we use both conventional treatments as well as alternative and complementary ones. So we can use NSAIDs such as ibuprofen and naproxen and sometimes Celebrex um, but, and steroids and IVIG when necessary, um, as well as other immune modulating therapies. But we would also use uh, nutritional supplements such as glutathione and NAC, which are useful antioxidants. And then really important to eliminate toxic exposures such as mold and uh, chemicals um, such as even Teflon and pesticides and avoiding preservatives. Um, I would recommend using as few processed foods as possible and specifically really avoiding the preservative sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate is uh, found in many liquids. So it's used to preserve things like liquid Motrin and it's in a lot of soft drinks and sodas. It's in a lot of salad dressings and um, studies that came out around 2007 um, showed that sodium benzoate causes hyperactivity in 15% of children. So you either are sensitive to it or you're not. But so many of our children who have uh, vulnerable brains and are very sensitive to things such as the children with PANS and PANDAS seem to be especially sensitive to sodium benzoate. Um, it can cause headaches, agitation, irritability, and hypersensitivity reactions. So I really recommend reading all your food labels and trying to get rid of sodium benzoate entirely from the diet. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes the chewables are better to use than liquids um, as much as possible. And there are products that don't have sodium benzoate. Um, back after that study came back in 2007, I think it was like by 2010, that even Coca-Cola removed sodium benzoate from all of its products, which was just a huge victory for the world of ADHD and hyperactivity. But most of the other companies still use it. So you have to read labels. And again, rem removal of toxic toxins. Really, we're trying to do everything that we can to remove um, anything from the child's environment and their food being a really big part of that environment that could cause inflammation. So as far as the diet, we're looking at trying to encourage an anti-inflammatory diet, um, which I have on that pyramid there. And let's see, I'll discuss that further in a few moments. Um, so one of the key problems in PANS is the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So usually our blood-brain barrier that is, a, uh, is able to prevent things that aren't supposed to get to the brain, like toxins and antibodies and infections. And um, however, this is a core problem in what happens to people who are experiencing a PANS and PANDAS. Um, the blood-brain barrier becomes leaky. It becomes broken down and allows the antibodies to get to the brain. Um, and this has been shown in multiple studies. I mentioned one here that they did at Columbia, um, Dr. Agula, and maybe some of you have seen him, him speak, um, but where they have were able to demonstrate the permeability of the blood-brain barrier uh, related to pandas. So in order to decrease, so a lot of this is due to increased inflammation in the brain, and they show this with elevated levels of interleukins and other uh, biochemical markers that show inflammation. Um, so we can work to try to decrease inflammation using antioxidants um, and such as NAC and glutathione, and also using turmeric and curcumin. So NAC is N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is a precursor to glutathione. And glutathione is a very pow powerful antioxidant in the brain. It helps to modulate glutamate. And we know that glutamate is very highly correlated to OCD. Um, the higher levels of glutamate, we have more obsess obsessions and compulsions. Um, NAC can be used to reduce OCD and intrusive thoughts. Um, and 
it's very tolerable. It can, there are not many side effects. Um, it's also, again, fascinating to me, the relationship to Parkinson's. When we treat people with Parkinson's with NAC and glutathione, they actually have improvement of the sim symptoms. Um, the improvements don't last very long in Parkinson's. If you have someone with very severe Parkinson's, you can give IV glutathione and they will have dramatic improvement, but it will only last one to two days. So they would need to have continuous infusions of glutathione. But at lower levels, by using NAC, uh, up to 2,400 milligrams, uh, we can see significant reduction in rigidity and intrusive thoughts and OCD behaviors. And I want to go back for one second. And I didn't really, and glutathione is also wonderful, um, but it's just much harder to take orally. It does not have good bioavailability availability. So you, there are forms of glutathione that can be used orally when it's used sublingually and there are lozenges, but I find them really difficult to use in children. I have better success with adults. Um, a lot of the lozenges have to be kept in the mouth for like 20 to 30 minutes, like the one company they recommend putting it in your mouth and then, you know, driving to work um, without chewing it or swallowing it. And these are just really tough instructions to give to children. There, there are some pastes of glutathione that you can keep in the mouth for, um, they say to keep them there for, you know, 30 to 60 seconds, and then you get pretty good absorption, but they tend to be quite expensive. Uh, Research Nutritionals makes one that's a paste. Um, and, you know, so, so for children, I tend more towards using NAC because it's cheaper, it's more available, and we know that it's going to have better uh, absorption and, and bioavailability. Um, so toxic exposures are really, really important. I'm not going to spend much time on it today just because we can't talk about everything. Um, it could really be an entire other talk, uh, but moldy environments in children's homes and schools can often be an underlying trigger. Like sometimes we wonder, why did this kid get pans and this one get pandas and the other people didn't? Well, sometimes it can be related to their overall body toxic burden and mold can be one of those things. About 20% of people are genetically predisposed to having tr trouble with mold toxicity and um, unable to break down mold toxins. Um, so, you know, there are things we can do. You can evaluate the home and the sc school with tests for mold using ERMI and Hertz Me dust swabs. You can also do visual contrast screening tests as a base, like just as a very simple test. Um, they can be done online. They cost about $15 and you can do them yourself. Uh, but this is really a big topic and uh, a very uh, complex area, but certainly something to consider, especially if your own personal environment, you know your child is exposed to mold or you're living in a home that has high levels of mold. So I'm gonna turn now to nutrition. Um, back to this anti-inflammatory food pyramid. This pyramid is different than the one that we all probably saw when we were in school and also that our children are being taught today. Um, this is an anti-inflammatory approach. So nutrition is just so very important for children with these difficulties. Um, it can both place a child at risk for getting pans and pandas, and it can also help to modulate the immune response and inflammation to allow for healing. So people have different nutritional requirements for optimal health based on many factors, including their genetic differences in their metabolism and their environment um, and other autoimmune diseases. So metabolites can be tested for in urine using organic acid testing. Um, also blood and hair tests can be used to help um, to evaluate nutritional status and help to better personalize and direct treatment because it's really gonna be different for each individual. Um, so 
Because we see so much food restriction in our children with PANS, these diet changes are really, really hard to do. And I understand that. Um, so it's very important to try to do make some changes in between flares and to make changes within the entire family so that just the child isn't singled out, but the whole family is moving towards more of an anti-inflammatory approach. This is really a lifelong family-wide process to shift the body away from autoimmunity and towards health. And this is what will also help reduce our risk of other autoimmune diseases because PANS is an autoimmune disease. And the problem with autoimmune diseases is once you have one, um, we know that you are much more likely to develop others. Um, so the base of this anti-inflammatory diet is vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. And then we also have healthy fats, such as nuts, especially walnuts and seeds and avocado. And then a focus on fish, especially the fatty fish, such as salmon and herring and sardines. And these are the ones with the highest content of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it also suggests lots of soy and cooked mushrooms. You can't eat raw mushrooms, they're toxic. Um, and when we're looking at decreasing inflammation, for most children, we are really looking at limiting their intake of dairy um, and instead using dairy alternatives and also limiting the intake of uh, red meats, which tend to be more inflammatory. Um, it's using skinless chicken and turkey and uh, sources that are, you know, as good as you can get. I know we can't always get organic meats, um, but, you know, trying the best to do the best that we can. Um, also, knowing that organic products can be much more expensive, I would suggest that you especially look at the Dirty Dozen and those 12 uh, fruits and vegetables that have the highest levels of pesticides. Those are the ones to really focus your your time, you know, your money on if you have to choose, you know, don't worry about buying organic bananas because it's not as important, but for strawberries, 100%. So um, especially because so many of our children have food restriction and food avoidance, supplementation with multivitamins, minerals, and micronutrients is often helpful and really often needed and often a very important part of the treatment. And often once we replace their nutrients and get them um, well-nourished again from a nutritional standpoint, um, the, some, many of the symptoms will decrease and they may then be able to eat a more varied diet. Um, let's see, that's really just repeating just what I said already. Um, so I know how hard it is to get a good diet in of healthy foods. Um, so I do often suggest supplementing uh, with multivitamins and with protein, with protein shakes, uh, especially when diets are really restricted. Uh, these are a few products that I've found to be helpful. Um, that first one there, the Enough, it comes in a little tiny can. It looks kind of big there, but it's actually like a pepper shake. It's like a traditional pepper shaker size and it is concentrated vegetables. Um, I've had really good luck with this, even in children who have ARFID, who, who have ARFID and severe food restriction. Um, you can often use this and they won't have a great aversion to it. Um, it can be added to things like applesauce or nut butters or pudding or whatever they might take or just sprinkled on other food mixed into ketchup. Um, I've had one kid who they base, you know, they have four things they eat and one of them was ketchup and we were able to add this into ketchup and they were really agreeable. I don't usually try to hide foods. I mean, depending, you know best your own child. Um, but, you know, we try to get away from actually hiding that we're adding supplements because, you know, we want to continue to have trust with our children and, um, but, you know, talking with them about it and trying to get them to try new things. So um, frequently broad spectrum mic micronutrients uh, can be really helpful. And sometimes it can be a pivotal tipping in some of these children. Um, they've just become so malnourished that their body like isn't even ready for all of the other recommendations. But if we can get some nutrition in, 
uh, through vitamins and through micronutrients, we can see some improvement. Um, I show these studies because there's a couple brands that have actually done a lot of studies in mental health. And, um, you know, again, I have no financial interest and I wish that more companies did, did research uh, into mental health. But True Hope and Hardy Nutritionals are the two brand names that I've come across that have done research. They've done more than 35 different clinical trials, and these are just three of those. Um, these are three that have shown significant improvement in mood regulation, ADHD, and even in psychosis. So, you know, this is an area certainly to consider. Um, so back to magnesium, I mentioned magnesium to use in the bath in the form of Epsom salt baths and magnesium sulfate, um, but it can help in so many ways. Low magnesium is necessary, or is, is hard to test. You actually can't do blood tests very well for magnesium. Um, magnesium your body will keep it at a regular level in the blood. Um, and we could test it in hair and you can do some other, but I don't usually find it even useful to test for magnesium. Just if you have any difficulties with irritability, food restriction, anxiety, difficulty sleep, you likely need more magnesium. And so many children also have such low fiber diets and problems with constipation and gut difficulties and magnesium can really help us there too. Um, magnesium replacement can improve concentration, anxiety, depression, irritability, mood swings, um, and sleep. And um, we can also use it in, in ADHD, and a lot of our children have symptoms that are uh, consistent with ADHD. And it can reduce ticks as well. Sometimes when children are given stimulants for ADHD, they begin to have ticks. And um, I would look at their you know, giving magnesium can help to reduce the ticks. Also, definitely in those circumstances, a big red flag to check their iron. Um, so the stress of just having a chronic illness like pans and pandas also uh, uses excess magnesium. So many of our body processes use magnesium as a cofactor. And so we need more of it when we're under uh, physical and mental stress. Um, so just a couple of the uh, brands that I find useful. I mean, that Calm, maybe some of you have used. It's a powder. It also comes in, let's see, that's the mixed raspberry flavor. It also comes in like a strawberry lemonade. Even kids who have a lot of food aversion are often really open to taking this. The powdered version is really nice because we can titrate it. We can um, adjust the level We can start out with just a teeny tiny quarter teaspoon and give it at bedtime and continue to increase the dose um, until the children are having soft stools. And we don't want to go as far as diarrhea um, and have to really liquid loose stools, but we use magnesium and continue to increase it, uh, as we say, to bowel tolerance. So that just means until uh, you're basically not having diarrhea. Um, but also using um, lots of different forms of magnesium are available. And uh, this is an area that's really individualized based on the other review of systems of a child. Um, iron deficiency is really common in children in general um, due to their picky diet, even children who don't have pans and pandas. And it is even more common in children with hyperactivity and anxiety and depressed mood. And this can really be additive uh, like an additional problem for pans and pandas. Um, I actually have not yet evaluated someone who has had pans and pandas who did not have iron deficiency. Um, so I check a ferritin level and ferritin is, is always low. Um, ferritin has been studied in Tourette's 
And it is very well known and established that low ferritin levels are associated with increased ticks of verbal and motor ticks in Tourette's. Um, and by giving iron, you can stop the ticks. Um, iron plays a really critical role in the metabolism of dopamine. And dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters involved in OCD and motor and verbal ticks. So when you look at a ferritin level, though, um, our blood tests and a standard lab will often say that normal is all the way down to 12. And they'll say the range is between 12 and like, like 500. Like it's this ridiculously large range, um, but that's too low. Uh, in the studies where we they've studied ferritin for things like restless leg syndrome and also for Tourette's, we need to see ferritin up around 40. And I really prefer to see ferritin in the levels of 60 to 70. Um, the one like really difficult part of ferritin, and this is more for any of like the medical practitioners versus the parents, but is that ferritin is also an acute phase reactant. And that means it can be elevated falsely when you're in a state of inflammation. And so since we know we're in inflammation, so you have to balance that. I do like to look at iron studies and a TIBC and a percent saturation as well, just to have more confirmation. Um, and then just looking at ways to increase iron, we normally need to actually do an iron supplement because just getting iron in the diet is hard, but using iron rich foods, um, and you can also cook in cast iron pans and use uh, the lucky fish. You can buy a little iron fish that can be thrown into soups and anything that you're making and can help to increase the iron content. But really most kids need an iron supplement. Um, so low dose um, lithium. So nutritional lithium orotate, which is, and I, I talk about it in nutrition because it is a mineral. So it is found out in the soil and it is in our water. And levels of lithium vary very greatly throughout the world. And um, it's just fascinating to look at maps of lithium levels in the water and compare them to mental health. Um, you can compare them to, uh, to criminality with homicide and violent crime, and also compared to suicide. And it's um, clear cut that the areas with the lowest levels of lithium has, have the highest levels of mental health problems such as suicide and crime. Um, so you may be familiar with using lithium uh, that people use for bipolar disorder in as a prescription. And this is lithium carbonate. And it's typically used at doses of like 300 to 600 or 900 twice a day. And you have to be very cautious with it. It has to stay within a narrow therapeutic window. But when we're using nutritional lithium, we're using teeny tiny doses of lithium orotate. Um, so Lithium orotate is available over the counter and it can, can be given um, one or two milligrams at a time. It has dramatic positive effects on uh, mood with decreasing irritability and hypersensitivity. I see the most benefit in kids and people who are really irritable and very sensitive, like sensitive to their entire world. Everything is too loud, too hard, too soft, you know, too noisy, too sticky. Um, those type, the people who experience the world in that way uh, seem to find a lot of benefit with lithium. Also beneficial for our teens and girls who are having uh, perimenstrual difficulties and worsening of their symptoms around their period. Um, it's been studied for PMS and PMDD and uh, perimenstrual dysphoric disorder and has significant benefit. At these low levels, there are really no side effects. I mean, as uh, for precaution, I always check uh, kidney function first and check thyroid as well, but I'm doing those tests anyway in an initial evaluation. But after that, they don't need to be followed. Um, it doesn't cause weight gain or any of the other problems that we would see with prescription strength lithium. Um, lithium improves memory, and there's lots of studies being done in Alzheimer's for lithium and a lot of things. So it is possible to test. You can test hair levels for lithium. Um, you can't use blood tests. I mean, if you use blood tests for lithium, that's only if you're using high dose lithium. Um, if we do a blood test, we want it to be low. It, it should show zero lithium. 
Um, but doing hair tests, you can see what a lithium level has been over the previous three months or so. Um, so sometimes if people are uncertain or we're not sure if it's gonna be helpful, uh, we can test, test. Otherwise I feel super comfortable just using low doses of lithium in, in most children. And especially in our world where people are using bottled and filtered water, the lithium is usually removed. So many of us are having zero lithium. Um, let's see, zinc and copper are also really important, uh, especially with anorexia, food restriction, and ARFID. Zinc is so important. So I always check zinc levels. Um, if we can't check zinc levels, we supplement with zinc uh, because, you know, at least for short term uh, and at, at, you know, 15 milligrams or so once or twice a day, there aren't going to be any difficulties and we'll often see dramatic improvement. Um, when people are zinc deficient, they lose their appetite, they lose, things taste weird, things uh, seem not desirable. We replace zinc. Children who weren't eating before sometimes improve their appetite and are interested in eating foods that they were not interested in eating before. Also improves hyperactivity and, um, and inattention. Um, vitamin D, again, super important to both test. Uh, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, you know, we most, or in our regions here, we mostly have low vitamin D. Um, I guess we have people uh, on the call from all over the place, but everywhere I would suggest testing vitamin D because um, other places we're using sunscreen. So we're blocking getting vitamin D. Um, it's hard to get enough out of foods, especially and then we're not getting enough sun most of the time. The goal again is to get to a level of around 40 to 50. Our labs will say that less than 20 is a deficiency and between 20 and 29 is insufficient. But for optimal mental health, we're looking at levels that are much more around you know, 50, 60, 70, up to 80. We don't wanna get up over 100, then we're looking at toxicity. So it is something that has to be tested pretty regularly. Vitamin D must be given with foods that contain fat. And I find these drops really easy to give uh, under the tongue. Um, and, um, you can also do once a week supplements, which can make this much easier, especially in so many of these kids, we're giving them so many things that doing vitamin D just once a week can be really beneficial. It's at a much higher dose, um, but it is available over the counter and also as prescription at the 50,000 international units uh, in one capsule, but really it has to be tested. So you've got to talk to your practitioners and get your vitamin D levels tested. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, again, like very, very important for brain health. Our, our brain has uh, fat and cholesterol, the most metabolically active organ in the body. And lots of studies show low uh, levels of fatty acids associated with depression, anxiety, and even suicide. Um, so foods that we eat, are fish and walnuts, um, flax and some seeds, but this again is really hard. So most people, most of the most children are going to need a supplement of omega three fatty acids. Um, you have this is one supplement that is really important to use a good source. We want to make sure that we're having low amounts of toxins and low mercury. So um, Nordic Naturals is excellent and Barleen's makes these like fruit smoothie flavored that um, I found lots of kids will be acceptable to taking these. They taste good, they come in a lot of different flavors. <clears throat> um, and I'm just gonna, we're getting to short on time, but B12 and folate, so important to test for. Um, especially when children are food restricted, they mean a lot of times refusing meats and um, not getting enough vitamin B12. Um, folate has a lot of variability in our body's needs. And so we often need to look at our methylation status, have to see what the MTHFR uh, mutations are. You can do this testing through labs, through your doctor. It can also be tested through 23andMe. Um, but both B12 and folate, these are cofactors that are absolutely necessary in the production of neurotransmitters. And without them, um, 
people do not feel well and they mentally do not feel well. Um, can see really big turnarounds in replacement of B12 and folate when they've been deficient. Um, and again, looking at the precursors to neurotransmitters, amino acids are very, very important. Um, and again, when we're not getting those building blocks that we need, you know, so to make neurotransmitters, you need the amino acids that are in proteins. And so often if they're not getting them in as foods, um, I will use supplements. Um, this is something that I definitely think you should work with a provider with because especially in children under 12, um, we have to be kind of cautious about which amino acids are being used. Um, but in adults, I commonly use free form amino acids. Um, we can check serum amino acid levels to see what they are, and then we're not blindly guessing. Um, using an integrative and functional approach, it's not just throwing, throwing darts at the dartboard. We're first testing and evaluating and then making decisions based on that. Um, OPCs are uh, plant extracts and polyphenols, which have been found to be really helpful for attention, um, very useful in children with ADHD, um, and again, for those same reasons, can be useful in pans and pandas. Um, so they, it's a, this is a particular combination that includes curcumin and pine bark extract, uh, green tea extract, and blueberry and grape. Um, and it is, and those supplements have been shown to improve attention. Um, so, you know, I said we weren't really going to talk about infections, um, but no talk of integrative medicine could be complete without at least minimally mentioning the leaky gut. Um, so, so often this may even be the underlying trigger that we have to find to like, why did we get sick? Why did we get this autoimmune disease? Um, the, my, the gut microbiome is just so important. I mean, we have more bacteria in our intestines than we have our own cells in our entire body. And so many studies have been done in the last couple of decades of how this bacterial uh, microflora can affect mood. Um, so getting to the heart of gastrointestinal issues is just such an important part of care for people with pans and pandas. Um, so this could be, you know, the GI issues are a talk on their own. I just want to mention it here to make sure that it's something that you ask about and to talk to your providers about. Um, one, one thing that's really helpful is doing, a, again, an organic acid test through the urine, and we can see levels of clostridia markers. It can also be tested in stool, but that's, you know, much more cumbersome and more expensive. Um, and we're looking for elevation of something called HP, HPA, and this shows high levels of clostridia, and this can be directly inhibits the um, dopamine norepinephrine pathway and can be um, helped by either treating with antibiotics or antimicrobials. Um, we can use, you know, herbs or regular prescription antibiotics dependent on the particular child's situation. Um, or sometimes actually just treating with high doses of probiotics is helpful and important, and even just improving fiber. Um, if we give the child a lot of fiber, ideally for, through food, um, but otherwise through supplements, um, like the sun fiber is a white powder that is tasteless and you can't see it once you mix it in with even with water, you can't taste it. Um, and th that fiber is food for the good bacteria and we can help to improve the good bacteria to shift the balance. <clears throat> um, and so yeast is a big part of this too. Again, just briefly, I will mention to take a look at it. A lot of the symptoms of yeast overgrowth can be so similar to what we start out with, with pans and pandas. And unfortunately we do this, you know, we cause a lot of yeast overgrowth. We treat children with antibiotics, which is absolutely important and for many, many children, very, very necessary. Um, so then we have to take care of the problems that we cause and uh, yeast overgrowth 
growth can again be identified through stool or through urine testing, looking at organic acids. And then we can uh, provide supplementation and dietary changes to help change that. Um, so just as we're kind of finishing up with an integrative approach, I want to tell you what you already know is that PANS is very, very stressful on the family, but this has actually been studied. And we know that um, families taking care of children with PANS, it's actually considered to be um, more stressful than caring for people with Alzheimer's. Um, so that was a study done at, PAN at Stanford in 2016. And so we need support. So really important to bring more people on board to help your family. Um, in addition to these uh, you know, physiologic approaches, we also need to have psychosocial approaches. We need help from the schools. Um, we need to bring in psychologists and counselors. Even once the initial problem is being treated, this can there can be so much trauma left behind and so many habits left from OCD and, and behavioral and personality changes that bringing along counselors and therapists is really a cornerstone of treatment. Um, this is a resource that can be really helpful for the schools um, to help develop IEPs and 504s. <clears throat> And um, while we're waiting to get in to see therapists, because sometimes in my area it can take, you know, probably in yours as well, there can be wait lists for months and months. Um, these are a few books that I suggest. They, they really have cognitive behavioral therapy techniques in them that you can work with your children um, on their own. And so I really like those. Um, they're by Don Huber and, you know, available on Amazon and everywhere else. Um, so again, just integrative medicine is a multifactorial approach um, that maintains that healing is always possible, even when curing is not. And it follows the teachings of Hippocrates that the job of the physician is to cure sometimes, heal often, and support always. And um, that is what, you know, I hope that, that um, you know, Organizations like Aspire and other national organizations that are helping in the care of pans and pandas, this is what we're doing, providing support and help. And um, I really greatly appreciate the opportunity to present today. So thanks a lot. And um, I'd be available to answer some questions. Great. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful and very informative. And I took couple of notes for home. Um, and I've been doing integrative with myself for my pans and my two kids and they're very different pans and pandas. Um, also, um, so we got a lot of questions in um, through our registrations and Dr. Williams and I have gone through them. Many of them she answered during the course of her talk. And she also has a uh, hard stop coming up pretty soon. So I'm just going to go through a few of them, maybe um, try to combine them. Um, what is the role of low dose naltrexone LDN in treating pans pandas? You ever use that? Um, so I use it only, I've only used it a little bit. I've been learning more and more about it. Um, as far as what is the role of it, um, it is an anti-inflammatory. So our body has you know, multiple different uh, receptors and mechanisms available to, to decrease inflammation. And we talked about the one main one, that's the COX inhibitors. That's where the, um, the NSAIDs, the ibuprofen and all of that work. And using low dose naltrexone is just yet a different avenue to reduce inflammation. So I personally have only used it for a handful of people um, but I do think that there can, there's definitely a use for it in this disease. Okay, thank you. Um, Cause there's a lot of talk about it with different families, especially on the boards and. Oh and, yeah. Um, and then when we're looking at sort of that older teen, young adult population, Do you use any different treatment approach or do you use a different diagnostic approach since symptoms may have been ongoing for years? So really that's a two-part question. 
do you diagnose them a little different or do you do, take a different approach? And once you do diagnose them, do you take a different approach to healing? Um, well, so certainly if you're where you're coming into this and beginning diagnosis and treatment will really depend on what, you know, the direction and what we're doing. Um, so, you know, certainly if I'm seeing someone with an acute onset, that's going to be a very different approach. And I feel really fortunate and lucky. I'm like, okay, you know, this just began two weeks ago and you're, you know, how wonderful that your doctor sent you right to me. And this is the best. Um, but when it's been going on for, you know, five years, 10 years, um, 15 years, yeah, there's a different approach. I mean, I do for people who are have more long standing, I'm certainly going to still try to identify the infectious triggers, but it's going to be more of a part of the process versus if I'm looking at a child with just beginning, that's going to be my first place to start is we have to identify the inciting infection first. Um, but then after that, it's really very similar. I mean, I'm trained family medicine, so I don't bring a lot of distinction between children and adults. Like I'm used to kind of seeing the whole person and um, we'll again begin by looking at infection, nutrition, environmental toxins. So I don't know right. if that answers that question. But. It does. And it's, you know, we. Some, I'm sure you've used this analogy of peeling back the layers of the onion. Sometimes in those chronic cases or the yeah. long untreated cases, it takes a lot longer to just peel even one layer back to get to another one. And uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I can speak from experience on that. Um, and then we get this a lot. I think probably 90% of our webinar speakers answer this question, but it's always a good um, question to ask each time because it gives a good perspective. Um, you know, a lot of times our kids or our young adults or even me as an adult um, who's not so young, uh, we get a little bit of pill, pill fatigue, right? So even with my own kids, when I when they don't have pill fatigue, like I'm always trying to like protect them from it. Um, so do you have a uh, any way to prioritize between... Um, what and how you give and how much um, so that you don't overwhelm and yeah yeah I mean this is a really you know appropriate question and really very very difficult um, I can't say that I have one way to do it it's really individualized um, based on each person um, some of the the kind of tricks to get in more things and like I said not I don't mean tricks by hiding it I mean even for ourselves you know for yourself um, is doing what we can do as large amounts all at once. So often taking supplements that can be used as, you know, tinctures or extracts and um, herbs and even capsules that can be opened. And when we're using, you know, upwards of 15, 20 supplements, often we'll take as many of them as we can um, and put them into like a small amount of juice, like pomegranate juice or mango juice and, you know, do a shot of it. And that's a quick, easy way to get in a lot all at once or else adding them to um, smoothies, which we're getting nutrition from them, um, you know, using protein powders and then just adding everything to it. Um, but otherwise, I don't think I could give an easy answer to that, um, except that, you know, taking a really individualized approach and and, you know, sometimes nutrition is where we really need to start because, um, you know, if we, even if we start giving some of these other supplements that augment neurotransmitter levels, they're not going to be able to do anything if they're, we don't have the building blocks, like the macronutrients, the, the amino acids and proteins. Um, so I often prioritize nutrition first. Um, and nutritional supplements first. And then once we are feeling maybe a little better and a little more agreeable and less irritable, adding in other things. And that's, you know, I'm not, we have to get rid of the infection too. So. Yeah, I mean, depends on where you are. There's certain non-starters. Someone asked about in your, in the chat, the hair test that you mentioned, um, where, what hair test is that? Um, let's see. Um, Great Plains does a hair test that tests for lithium. There's a lot of different companies you can do hair tests. Um, 
uh, what's the other one? Doctors data also will test for lithium. And you know, they the others will test for like we're looking for heavy metals for toxicities, and then they'll do nutritional, like all the mineral values. Um, but those are the only two that I know that test for lithium. And again, I don't really need to test for lithium, but it's just interesting and fascinating. Like sometimes the test for lithium is checking your water. But yeah, those are the ones that I would use. Okay. And then to piggyback on the lithium orotate com comment, how, if you do give it as a supplement, roughly, uh, how soon may you see a change, um, a benefit from it? Okay. So lithium sometimes almost feels like magic. I mean, you hate to say that, but there are times when after the second dose of lithium, parents will notice an improvement or like adults, I almost think will more notice an improvement in themselves because maybe they can better um, articulate the subtle changes that they notice. So you can see a, a change really quickly. Um, but you can also see a change about at seven to 10 days. And like James Greenblatt is in my mind, like the expert on lithium, he's written books about it, you know, webinars, published articles. And, um, and Dr. Greenblatt, who's a, a psychiatrist, who's been doing this for, you know, 40 years, um, he does say, and he's a mentor of mine, he does say to give it you know, to really give it the two to three months that if you don't see a benefit right away, give it for two to three months. If you don't see a benefit at that point, then, then take it away for sure. Okay. But I've not waited that long. Like I've seen benefit much more quickly. All right, that's very interesting. Um, and then do you ever use inositol? Um, I do use inositol. Um, inositol has been studied. It's actually one of the like herbs, you know, or not, it's an honor, one of the supplements of vitamin that has been studied in an OCD specifically. And when inositol is combined with SSRIs, um, there's improvement. Um, so, but I don't really use it with SSRIs. I mean, if people come to me and they're already on SSRIs, I will, of course, you know, help to augment that. Um, but I don't prescribe a lot of SSRIs myself. So yeah, so inositol can be really helpful. Um, you have to get up to pretty high doses of it and it's big. Like, so you have to use it as a powder and I mean, it tastes pretty good. Um, so I think about using inositol, especially when there's a lot of intrusive thoughts. Um, so, you know, I do tend to use NAC first, but in, in especially people who the, the OCD is a really big part of the presentation will add in an acetal as well. Okay, great. Um, and then when you use a NAC, who are the patients that are most likely to react negatively? We hear talks about those with high yeast or sulfur issues. Do you find that? Um, so I think that the people who tend to ne react negatively to the nutritional supplements are, or to these supplements are often people who have other nutritional deficiencies. So if I get somebody who's really having, tr like has a negative reaction, um, then I make sure to go back and that we aren't missing nutritional deficiencies. Um, and then of course, always when there's a yeast overgrowth, we're gonna often see you know, poor reaction to lots of things. So if I see, you know, negative reaction to supplements, I double back and make sure we really aren't missing a big overgrowth of yeast. Yeah. I'm yeah. not really familiar with when you said about sulfur, that's not something I'm familiar with. Okay. Um, I've seen it talked about in several places. I know my kid, one of my kids goes bananas on NAC. Um, but he also has a lot of yeast issues. So <laughs> it's always a struggle. And he also has the lowest serum cysteine his doctor has ever seen. So we're always constantly trying. You mentioned um, preservatives in foods. What preservatives should we be wary for in supplements, you know, like stearate and other things like that? 
Well, yeah. sodium benzoate, number one, like it's my soapbox. Um, long before I was doing integrative medicine, I was aware of sodium benzoate because my daughter who has pandas had like a severe, severe reaction to um, sodium benzoate. I mean, actually became failure to thrive, weight loss for, you know, 18 months till we figured it out. Um, and, and it wasn't published at that time. It, the studies didn't come until two years later, but so sodium benzoate look for, um, um, all forms of glutamate you have to be careful of. So, you know, glutamate is involved in the whole pathway of development of OCD. And so, um, you know, avoiding MSG and any forms of glutamate. Um, I recommend avoiding nitrates as well, but I don't have as specific reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Potassium sorbate too. I would avoid potassium sorbate also. <laughs> but Yeah, things that you have to double check on how to pronounce things like that. I always like to ask, and someone actually brought it up in the chat, and this will be your last question because I know you have a hard stop to get back to your patients. Um, chlorine in swimming pools, things we can do to mitigate the fallout from the hell that it can sometimes cause. <laughs> yeah, really tough question. So um, salt, poop, you know, pools that are uh, using salt instead of chlorine, that's always wonderful. Um, but, you know, even despite that, I, for most kids, I think if they enjoy swimming and you're getting the benefits of exercise, it's, for most of them going to outweigh the problems that they're going to have with chlorine. So otherwise, and I know some people are super, super sensitive to it and it's just going to be a, um, not possible. Um, so if that's, if that's your child, then you have to find other forms of exercise or pools that are using salt water. Um, but otherwise, you know, showering as quickly as you can, when you get out, I don't have any other uh, suggestions. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've hit 1.30 and I know you got to get back, but we really appreciate you coming to speak with us. I remember hearing you when you spoke for the small PA group and I was like, we got to get her um, so she can be a larger audience, have a larger audience. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me and um, yeah, good luck to everyone. I know that this is really a hard illness. I just, my final screen uh, slide just popped up. I don't know if people are still seeing that or no. Yeah, they are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just actually threw this in at the end because I just wanted to give everyone like the doctors, the, the other practitioners and all the families, like that final word of encouragement that, you know, this is real. And when you have, I know how hard it is. You have people telling you it's not. And I like to respond by saying, oh, like, so, you know, just reminding them of the major academic centers in the U.S. Um, and around the world that have even established entire departments to address neuroimmune diseases. So um, that always in days when I'm feeling discouraged, I look at this list and uh, remind myself how this, this is this is a true illness to not be um, ignored. So so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye bye.